and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is one of my, is a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Bedrock Games. No Flintstones jokes, please. We've heard them all. And cr creator of the net of the various games in the network system. Most importantly for this, Wandering Heroes of Ogre Gate, which is now for which is now getting a full-on um, campaign ex campaign expansion in Sons of Lady eighty seven, which is a massive tome that even I, that even I had trouble getting with getting all the way through in one sitting. The one and only Brendan Davis. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. And uh, the Flintstones thing is actually a real problem. When I uh, when I picked the name, I was not even thinking Flintstones, and it never occurred to me that on search engine results, half of the rap, if somebody types in Bedrock, most of the results are going to be Flintstone related. Yeah, and when it, and when it comes to that. I've, I'm, um, I always try and stay one step ahead of whatever bad joke somebody's going to come up with. Well, yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, what, what's funny to me is it, I didn't even realize, like, I wasn't even thinking, like I said, of, uh, you know, of the Flintstones. So when people started commenting on the name like a year in, mm -hmm. it took a little while for me to realize what they were referring to. Um, cause I just named, I was just thinking literal bedrock. That's all I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> but everybody thought it was an allusion to the Flintstones. Um, and which actually, would not, yeah. which would not make any damn sense because no. you, because you write, kung, you write Kung Fu games. Where the hell yeah. does, where the hell does somebody get Flintstones from that? No, there's nothing Flintstones about anything we do. Um, but yeah, no, but other than that, I'm doing fine. I'm mm -hmm. doing fine. Yeah. So. As I mentioned before, Sons of Lady eighty seven is a is a massive tome when it when it comes to what what a lot of people expect from a uh, campaign book or even even a mod even a module book. Most people, you'd I'd be sho I'd be shocked if someone expected a module book to go over one hundred and fifty pages. Yeah. Um, now, of course, you've got Elder Brain over there, but Elder Brain are absolute madmen. <laughs> I I've told you I told you about that before we went live. Yes, yeah, and that that's that's like three times I think as long as mm -hmm. uh, as this one. So well, like like I said, they're madmen. But tell me about the origin story of Sons of Lady eighty seven because if I recall correctly, this is more of a crime fiction leaning campaign compared to some of the other stuff you've done with Ogre Gate. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, the origin is basically. You know, I was I, I was running a number of Wandering Heroes of Overgates campaigns, and I was reading this book called Crossing the Gates, which is a sort of history of women uh, during the Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And there's a section in the book where they talk about this woman, Lady Eighty Seven, um, and she was fascinating. She was like a crime lord. She sounded like she sounded like Livia from I Claudius. She was just this really powerful woman that had created a shadow empire. And was uh, was a real thorn in the empire's side, um, and so I thought it would be interesting to to do something with that. So I started out with just doing a blog entry on it, and then mm -hmm. I started the eighty seven or lady eighty seven campaign with the you know an organization. The game is the eighty seven killers. They're kind of this again this shadow empire of criminals and assassins, and I just started this little campaign, and from there I started writing the book and. Mm -hmm. It turned out that, uh, you know, like a lot of the books, it starts out like, oh, maybe this is going to be a module. And then I realized, oh, no, this is actually kind of a setting book. And and then it grew into this idea of, well, I kind of always wanted to do a campaign book. So, you know, a setting book, but also sort of provide people with an idea of how to do a long-term Wandering Heroes of Ogre Gates campaign. So mm -hmm. this one is just intended to give you a little bit more of a glimpse into the you know sort of like what goes on behind the gm screen and it has a chapter that 
gives the GM uh, sort of a starting point for a potential campaign. And, you know, but it's it just, I don't know, it just kind of grew uh, as, as, uh, as this, this essentially a kind of uh, mafia style Wandering here is a Volgrigate campaign that I was running based on the uh, the Lady 87 person that I had read about in the book. Mm-hmm. And I think the uh, the page the reason why I focused on the page count so much is compared to some of the other adventures, the only one that I can think of that comes close in terms of page count was the Tournament of Dao Lu, and that was 133 pages. Yeah, that's true. Well, also oh, uh, uh, Ogre, Ogre Gate Inn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ogre Gate Inn. Um, but those were both pretty long. And Terminator Dalu is only a PDF, so that almost doesn't count because it's like I don't know. It feels different somehow. It's 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 not it's not as bound by page count concerns, anyways. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, th- this one I, I originally wanted it to be shorter. I realized it couldn't be, and that you know. So then when I realized it was going to be in the three hundred page zone that that i mean that was kind of inevitable it just it it kind of had to be that length based on the material i was putting into it what's also interesting is that in addition to the uh, massive book you also had a map of the region it takes place font shu yes yeah that map was by rob conley that's a Mm -hmm. it's a usually so our books usually have one hex map which is like the the sort of regional this is how you tell how far people are traveling along the road type of a map. Yep. Um, and hold, then that, we have, hold that thought. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so are we back? Yep. Okay, so um, yeah, so I uh, I was talking about the map. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so we usually have one regional map that's kind of the, you know, it's got like the, it's got the spatial stuff. So you know where the players are going and all of the important locations. And those are usually done by Robert Conley. And then we have maps by Francesca Burrell that are more like the, you know, individual location maps, uh, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the document. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, the, those are, you know, between. Uh, uh, I can't remember why I brought up the map, but I think you would have been asking a question about it. Um, um, I was ju- I was just pointing out the in- the interest in-, in it because of the amount of detail. Um, oh, okay, okay. Now. One thing, one thing that I, that I am, I am curious about, because what I've, from what I'm seeing of the way the book is laid out, you have a, you have an introductory adventure just to get people into the region, and then everything after that is a sandbox. Would that be accurate? Yeah, that would be accurate. Um, there are tools sprinkled throughout the book, and there's an appendix. Mm-hmm. that is pretty extensive but it's basically it's it's basically a sandbox where i again i try to give you more of a glimpse behind the gm screen mm-hmm. as a reader because i get a lot of questions about ogre gate and i was trying to answer as many of those questions as i could um you know there are things that i take for granted as a gm that i realized some people don't and i was trying to be more mindful of that so that i could give people a better window into okay this is how you run this do you know what i mean um but it's basically you're right it's a uh you know, it provides you with that 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 jumping point, and then it provides a, a sandbox setting. Mm-hmm. And one, the thing, the big reason that I said that is, each of the districts has has um a thing a thing about the law of the the law of the land, the some of the major places and the major players within it. Mm-hmm. Um. And of and of course and of course stat blocks with it within that, um, have, within e- within each of within each of the districts do you, um, do you have do you have story for those who are who would be jumping into it do you have story seeds to, kind of fa- kind of give ideas on what on what kind on what kind of story you could do in a given district. I mean, I think the the easiest thing. I mean, this is all kind of like I said, it's sandboxy mm-hmm. and it's generally character driven. So a lot of it is going to be about what the PCs are doing, but the seeds are in the NPCs mostly. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if you if you look at the NPC sections, then you're going to see, uh, or the entries, you're going to see, you know, what people are after, what they're looking for, what they're motivated by, and also the sex that are in those regions. Mm-hmm. Um, this is largely built around the idea of having unfolding sect wars among mostly criminal 
you know, martial sex. Mm. So it's kind of a, it's it, again, it's got a very sort of, you know, gangster uh, vibe to it. So those are the things that the GM probably want to look towards if they're, they're thinking in terms of where are the seeds, um, but it's very open. So obviously, you know, it's a, it, it doesn't, it doesn't give you like a list of this is what you should do in this area. Um, you know, it's very, that's very much up to the GM and up to the players based on what, what they decide to do. Mm -hmm. And I'd also, I'd also seen that you have a, you have a set, you have a few tape, a few random tables set up to help simulate the, mo the moving and shaking about of the, di of the different sects. Cause obvious, obviously the sects don't exa aren't exactly going to like each other for one reason or another. And, probably aren't going to like that there's a bunch of um a bunch of shock coming in coming in and mucking things up yeah and those tables were actually one of the more useful things that i used in my campaign i first started that concept in the war of swarming beggars adventure which is on the bedrock blog and that was originally planned as a as a release like this one but it just didn't materialize for a variety of reasons mm -hmm. um but i was able to refine that concept and apply it here and again, the, the premise of this book, it assumes that the players are probably going to be part of the 87 Killer organization, but they don't have to be. They could be part of any of the sects that are in the region. Uh, but it does at least assume some kind of unfolding sect war. And what the sect shakeup table allows you to do is it, it, it makes it less of a, well, the GM just kind of planned it so that this would happen and this would happen and that would happen. And um, you can do it that way. But my preference as a GM is I like to be surprised and I like to feel like I'm not, I don't know, that I'm not just kind of creating an arc of events that the players are going to kind of experience. And so this, you know, like, and you can kind of roll on it ad hoc as you want, but, you know, say you do it once a week or once a month, or if you want to, you could even do it once every session. It just leads to unexpected things happening like one sect developing a conflict with another or sex allying with each other or, so, or somebody trying to assassinate one of the leaders of the sex and i i just found it very useful um for keeping keeping the campaign vibrant um and also it kept me on my toes as a gm i like mm -hmm. i like um i like getting a result like that and then saying okay what does that mean and, and then and then, and then trying to make that relevant to the players too, because you have to figure out a way that that they that this information makes its way to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, I don't know. I I I, I would say that it's uh it's it's one of the key one of the key tools in the book. Mm -hmm. I and I can I can certainly get behind that. Now, when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to the whole thing with the eighty-seven killers, um, have people? How if somebody wanted to do a campaign where they were where they were from a diff where they're in a different sect? Um, how would they go about? How would they go about it compared to use compared to using the eighty-seven? I mean, in much the same way because the sects are all still there. They're not. I mean, obviously, the eighty-seven killers do get a more full treatment. They have a whole chapter. And, you know, I even give a list of every every one of the 87 killers. Um, they're not all statted out, but you have a list of all the names and their rank. Um, and many are statted out. Uh, but the other sects also are, are fleshed out. They're, you know, the leadership is all described. And the only difference is you have to account for the details of the sect. But otherwise, this is the kind of game where the players are c basically given initiative to you know, help expand the sex interest. And so that's really the key to making it work. Mm -hmm. um, right now I'm running a, a, a campaign where the players are going to be members of the Celestial Plume Masters. And they're, they're kind of the group that's in opposition to the 87 Killers in the, mm -hmm. in the setup of the, uh, of the campaign book. And so that's going to be coming at it from an entirely different angle. I ran a campaign where the players were all constables, just kind of roaming around and, you know, uh, being assigned different tasks, but also able to pursue their own sort of their, their own understanding of justice. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like a dirty Harry style killer constable type of campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I think I even talk about it in the appendix. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, it's pretty easy. I think, um, you know, I, I, this, this is, I've been running campaigns in this region using the material from this book for the past five years. And so 
I have a, a lot of experience with it. And, you know, we, I, I had another player, Kenny, in my game. He ran a campaign where the players weren't part of the 87 killers. We were, we were kind of uh, free agents. And, you know, we ended up, I think we ended up allying with um, uh, the Vermilion Bird Tea House and some mm -hmm. other groups. And yeah, I mean, it's just it's just about knowing the different sex and where where everything fits together in that respect. And then I think that, again, the key to this campaign is really giving the players the ability to uh, to to smash the scenery a little bit, you know. And since the eighty seven killers are are such a major player with this, I'd like to go. I'd like to go a bit into. Kind of the skinny of them as an organization, their their particular goals and the and the like, and who and who is kind of a thorn in their side. Okay, um, I mean the basic setup is they're like they're sort of presented as the most powerful organization in the area. You know, Lady Eighty Seven is established, pretty firm control. And mm -hmm. the plot line is kind of it's sort of Godfather like like the there's now these celestial plume masters that are bringing in this this drug, uh, and they're doing so within the eighty seven killers territory, and that is that is challenging the established order, mm -hmm. and they're allied with a, with another sect that is further to the south, and and so their whole thing is number one they want to <laughs> they want to find out what's going on with this threat and stop it. But they're also looking to um, to take control of whatever this the dr drug in the game is called Celestial Plume. Mm -hmm. Take control of this, uh, you know, of whatever the source is, and then you know, use it for themselves, basically. Yeah. And would it be fair of me to say that li that um, that Lady Eighty Seven herself is? Since you mentioned you mentioned the original inspiration being this kind of um, under this kind of shadow empress, I'm guessing that's the same thing that applies here. Yeah, it's modeled after that. It's modeled after the history. I mean, again, obviously, it's not. Don't mistake this for a history book by any means. <laughs> obviously go not. Read, yeah, go read Crossing the Gates. It's a fabulous book, and read the sections on Lady Eighty Seven. I, I just every once in a while you encounter something in a book like that, and mm -hmm. it's like you're stunned to see it because it's so surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I highly encourage people to, to check that one out. But I, I think, and also I'm getting some echo. I don't know if you can hear it on my end. Um, um, but uh, I could hear it for a bit. I could hear for it for okay. a bit, but I don't hear it anymore. Okay, cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, um, yeah, but I would definitely encourage people to check that out. But the, the history, I, I took a lot of the, the basic elements, you know, the way that they described her amassing her power, the kinds of activities they were engaged in with salt mines and stuff. Like she's got, she's got her, she, she's doing her own salt mining and, you know, she's taxing the population. She's doing all kinds of things that the government normally does and that other people aren't supposed to do. And so, uh, you know, I took a lot of that stuff and I took the poisoning, you know, they poison a lot of their enemies. They kill a lot of their enemies. Um, and I took the elements of, you know, how she cultivated officials and, you know, got them in under her influence and how she put her sons into, you know, she managed to get them into key positions. Mm -hmm. um, she, again, she's just this very Livia-like character. And that's always been my favorite villain, uh, you know, in, in like anything. So, um, so I was just trying to get as much of that in here as possible. But again, a lot of liberties because obviously this isn't china it's I, I put her into a fictional setting mm -hmm. and i i also gave her all kinds of kung fu and you know you know i mean there's you know, there's no mention of any of that in the uh in, in the in the in the sections that uh crossing crossing the gates discussed yeah but the vibe that i get with her is that she rarely she rarely shows up but all that somebody would have to do is is bring up her name and that and that's enough to get somebody to shit bricks Yes, yeah, that's correct. That's definitely correct. And, uh, and and again, if the players are in the in the organization, they will see her. But whenever I introduce the party to her, you know, it's always a, it's always like a big deal. It's not like she just shows up and says hi. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the way it should be because I've I've always seen the higher ups in in crime fiction or even some noir stories. As akin to the Minotaur, and you're in the labyrinth. 
Okay. You okay. can do yeah. you can you can do plenty of movement, but don't you dare get the Minotaur's attention because collateral damage is inevitable. Yeah, no, you you, you don't want to get you you definitely don't want to attract her attention, and especially in a negative way. Mm -hmm. uh, she's she's certainly that type. Sometimes even in a positive way. <laughs> yeah, no, that can actually be an issue too. One of the uh, again, there's a character in the book named Boris Drunken Sword, and that's based on a PC who uh, married into the into Lady Eighty Seven's family. And in his case, the positive attention was not not necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and one of the other th one of the other things I could I couldn't help but notice is that you added you added in a lot of player facing material as well as well as GM facing, um, whether it be new ri new rituals, flaws, a lot and a lot of new kung fu techniques. Yeah, that's. There's always a lot of that stuff in these books. It's mm -hmm. just the nature of. It's the nature of the genre. It's the nature of the game. You know, like mm -hmm. if you, you know, you watch kung fu movies or wuxia movies or you read wuxia fiction. There's there's always new groups with new techniques, and it, that's kind of like the the fuel <laughs> of a lot of this. And so, as a GM, I'm always making new techniques, and players are making them. And so, th th but this book especially, this book has more kung fu techniques than any of the other books with the possible exception of the core rule book mm -hmm. um it's got a lot uh and and again there's you know there's equipment and stuff that's i i wouldn't necessarily say i see it as player facing though i, I mean certainly players are going to want to make use of it but i see that more as stuff that the gm would make available to them in the course of a campaign um but it's not necessarily something i see people uh, I think I think a game like this, you don't necessarily want people reading through all of the kung fu techniques and then asking for them. Um, it's it's better if they if they acquire them through the setting itself, um, because you you know again, th there are power spikes in this game. It's designed intentionally that way, and when you have those kind of power spikes, you don't you don't want to kind of give everybody the full list. Um, you know, unless you're prepared to deal with that. <laughs> you know, I've done that. And it can be dealt with, but you know, you you uh, you, uh, you you will have more players who are uh, having some of the stronger kung fu techniques in the game, and you have to be uh, you have to be ready to anticipate that in play. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, to, and of course, the, of course, I had also seen the. Um, the intro the introduction of a lot of a lot of new different poisons and the like obviously obviously the primary one is celestial plume because that's an important um factor when it comes to the game yep yep um, um i'm sorry go on but in the appendixes what i had, what I had also seen that i found interesting is have is having a handful of ca of um campaigns in fact, in fact, two of them primarily. That it's, it seems that the, it seems that those are as a example to move things along if need be. Um, yeah. Uh, which campaign were you thinking of in particular? Just so um, can... the three constables, as well as Hanging Valley of the Dead and the Seven Blood Cave Alliance. Ah, okay. Yep. So the 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 three constables one. That's the one that I mentioned before, where I had characters who were constables, and and really, I'm just I sort of put that in there. Because I knew some people might want to do it from the other angle of law enforcement or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I had this campaign and I was writing about the campaign online and I realized it's kind of entertaining. And so I thought, well, it would be a good, uh, it would maybe be a good illustration of, I, I think I saw it more as an example. As an, you could theoretically take what I provide and actually run it because I do, I do give you the adventure breakdowns a little bit and it's actually possible to, to use the material to run a few adventures um but i really was thinking of it more as an example to people like okay this is this is another this is a way that you might run a a small campaign uh that isn't involved in the criminal underworld or at least not as part of the criminal underworld um mm -hmm. now i should say in that campaign my my characters the players became very corrupt constables and so they eventually did become part of the criminal underworld but you know that that was you know that one campaign yeah, and to be fair, to be fair, that certainly fits within the within crime fiction when it comes to the when it comes to the cop on the edge motif. 
Yeah. Oh. No, it does. It does. You know, just and how I, far I, they're willing to take it. And I and and again, it was largely inspired by the movie Killer Constable, which is pretty much like a wusha version of Dirty Harry. Mm-hmm. And so I just told them, you know, I, I explained that to them, you know, that's sort of what I'm thinking, and do whatever you want. And so yeah, that's that's where we, things went. Mm-hmm. And. I get the I get the feeling that whenever you've done the elevator pitch with this, you've 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 had it lean into crime fiction, then into what a lot of people view uh, wuxia. Yeah, and and I mean part of that is because there are actually wuxia movies that have crime fiction elements to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a movie like Killer Clans, I I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's mo- at least inspired by The Godfather. I can't say that 100%. Um, mm-hmm. It's not The Godfather, but there are story beats in there that are very similar. Um, you know, there's a there's a movie called Duel for Gold, which is one of my favorites. And that's like a it's like a Quentin Tarantino movie almost. Do you know what I mean? It's there, there, there you know, there's, there's because there are criminals in the, in, in the martial world, right? It, it makes sense that, you know, it can sometimes be the focus. Um, another one would be reign of assassins. Um, and again, that's one about a character that's trying to leave this criminal world that she's part of, but it's very much about, you know, it's, it all revol- revolves around the heist of, of a, of a Buddhist relic. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it. I think that that. I think the the really the wuxia movies that I like, like that, and like Intimate Confessions of a Chinese Courtesan, and these they're sort of these darker, more crime oriented wuxia films. Uh, a lot of them do this genre blending that I think really works well, and so that's what I was trying to do here. I was I was trying to take inspiration from other genres um, and apply them here because I I think that that's sometimes when when I mean again I like I like wuxia in its pure form too. But I also like wuxia when it uh, when when it's like you know clearly blending in other elements. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and with that with that kind of thing in mind, in some cases I've I've asked I've asked about the sca- about the scaling range when it comes to uh, when it comes to ca- when it comes to campaigns, uh, but. Ogre Gate doesn't doesn't really have that. It just has the th- just has the three tiers of martial hero, profound master, and immortal. Would it be fair of me to say that this one would primarily focus on the fir- the first tier and maybe and maybe the second, but not going higher than that? Yeah, and I would say that's true of most Ogre Gate campaigns. Ogre Gate in kind of gets a little bit higher up on that profound level. Um, this one does have, there is an immortal sect in this book, but they're not really meant to be part of the campaigns or anything. They're just, they're, they're physically in that region. So I had to include them. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I mean, the truth is, I think most Ogre Gate campaigns tend to be between levels one and eight. That's sort of a sweet spot for the game I find. Um, and so you have characters that span that range in this game and, Sometimes it's not the characters that you would think. Like the character, you, you know, I'm not going to tell people what Lady 87's chi rank is, but it might not be what people imagine it to be based on, you know, what the, you know, some of the other characters in the region are. Um, you know, I, I think that it can be, uh, you know, it, it's 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 always good to have <laughs> bigger threats available to you in a, in a region. Um, you know, every once in a while having having a really devastating master who's a recluse but can come down and do some real destruction can be handy mm-hmm. um, story-wise. So, uh, but yeah, I would say martial hero to to low-level profound is what you'd find in this book. Mm-hmm. Now, when you did, when you were doing playtesting for it, what were some of the big takeaways that you had with your, with the experiences with your playtesting group? Um, for this specifically, or for Ogre Gate yeah. in general? Um, for this specifically, I mean, it was all stuff like it basically um, was things that all worked their way into the book. Like, oh, I need a table for this, or I need to provide this kind of information, or I need to revise. You know, like at one point, I had Kenny run games instead of me because I wanted somebody else looking at the like. You know, I I, I might be imagining stuff in my head that isn't on the page when I'm looking at an NPC and that might be distorting my sense of whether the entry is complete enough. So, you know, having him run it and then ask him what he needed 
and you know looking at the areas where where he was having difficulty running it because he didn't know what to do if the players did x y or z uh so it was kind of more an experience of okay the game the the book needs this or it needs this explanation or it needs this table um and there was also obviously stuff where uh you know techniques were being refined um and you know the, the, like you know mechanics were being honed in, into 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 uh uh you know different states and some of the material was being expanded like the um you know over the course of play i realized that i needed more than one type of celestial plume and mm-hmm. so you know that's that's how i ended up with with multiple forms of celestial plume um so you know and, and also things like the 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 prices of the you know sometimes when you first write these things you you don't even realize oh yeah i need to make sure that they know what the prices are going to be when they sell them on the street kind of a thing so mm-hmm. you know you know all of that stuff um it was just it was mostly details and um it was also focus like um i mentioned in the introduction that i i shaved down a lot of the supernatural elements because this was more of a crime campaign so just to give one really glaring example um the hua yin who's the leader of the vermilion bird tea house and again i can say this because she's uh, I've changed this, so it's no longer a detail about her character. But originally, she was a spider demon. She was a really powerful spider demon. And that wasn't going to work for the kind of campaign I wanted this to be. So very early on, that was one of the big changes I made. And then from there, I made, I, I started making very similar changes throughout the region. Mm-hmm. Um, so stuff like that. The, the wanted poster stuff, that all, a lot of that came out of playtesting. Wanted posters have always been part of the game, but this was a campaign where it really became relevant to have like mechanisms for managing that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and again, uh, some of my explanations for how to handle encounters and things like that—that that was in observing how how someone like Kenny was was managing the encounter tables and um, some assumptions that I just was carrying with me that weren't necessarily on the page. Um, so yeah, that. I don't know, just a lot of little different things. <laughs> mm-hmm. And of course, I'd I'd seen that you had put in pl- plenty of those references in um, other sources of inspiration. But it's it sounds like some of the some of the more some of the more supernatural leaning aspects of Wuxia you decided to not get rid of, but but de but de emphasize to better focus on the crime fiction side of things. Yeah, yeah, and again, I mean, there is like supernatural wuxia in the sense of you have techniques that are doing these things, and there are a few, you know, like minor powerful items, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I I tried to stay away from anything that would get into the realm of like a Chinese ghost story uh, type stuff. So like uh, Mm -hmm. Daozhu Village, there was originally a much larger supernatural plot line in that area and i got rid of and, and it was actually quite interesting it was it was one of these things where i kind of hated taking it out because i pref- i liked the supernatural material that was there but it just didn't work for what i was trying to do here um so i had to take it out um i think it's still up on the blog and one of the adventures i have up there um but there was just this whole side adventure with the temple that was quite interesting and you know i, I again i had to I, I had to pare all that down just for the uh keeping it in 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 with the the crime focus mhm and with the, with that in with that in mind uh i haven't i haven't i didn't i didn't double check the drive through rpg page but is sons of lady 7 up, up on the dtrpg page yet or is it going to be up in in the coming weeks it's up now. It's up on right. Drive Through RPG for in PDF. It'll be out in print. I, I should say none of our stuff is in print on Drive Through RPG, so it's mm-hmm. all through Studio Two and available in other places. And I usually have a link on the website. Mm-hmm. That I don't know exactly when, but hopefully, hopefully December, November is you know it'll be it'll be out in print. Um, it just depends on shipping and all that stuff. Yeah, um, and, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that, that's always kind of tricky, and I was doing everything to the final hour on this one, so you know, if it is a little bit late, it's my fault. But the 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 PDF is up for I think like twelve ninety five on um uh on drive through. Yep. And, uh, 
and I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how things shake out with it since since um since not since by this point now it's I'd say it's been out for a few, it looks like according to the page you put it up on November the first. Yep, I did, and I did. I didn't do any advertising or anything, so I just put it up. It's out there, um, and it's available if people want to get it. Yep. I may, I may, I may try to draw more attention to it down the road, but I, uh, I was really just trying to get it done. That was mm. really the, the, the goal. Yeah, I can, I can certainly understand that. Um, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back to the temple. Oh yeah, no problem, no problem. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.